Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. This episode features Tren Griffin. Tren is a very unique thinker, a bit of a renaissance man, if you will. Many of you may know him from Twitter. You can find him at Tren Griffin. You may also know him from his writing at 25iq.com. Or you may have read one of his seven books, one of which is Charlie Munger, The Complete Investor. My biggest takeaway from this conversation is the idea of giving to get, the importance of bravery, and just listening to Trend's background and how he used his good fortune and where he grew up to leverage that in order to propel his own career and now how interested he is in giving back to propel other people's careers and lives. I have a lot of respect for how Trend goes about what he does, and I hope that you all enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by Stream by Mosaic. You can find them at streamrg.com. That's S-T-R-E-A-M-R-G.com. Stream is an expert interview transcript library that's become integral to my research process. I first discovered them roughly a year and a half ago, and I've watched them build out a very robust transcript library. Stream by Mosaic provides over 300 expert interviews per week. 70% of their experts are found exclusively on stream, and each interview goes through three layers of compliance screening. Recently, someone said stream is table stakes for good fundamental analysis. I couldn't agree more. During this episode, we briefly discuss Costco. While it's a well-known company in the investment community, I found this anecdote on stream interesting. It was a Sam's Club employee that was discussing Costco, and he said, I start these calls with one of the reasons of why Costco is Costco is just the word consistency. They've had consistent leadership, consistent strategy, consistent real estate approach, and consistent messaging with their members. Everything I could speak to on what I think the reasons why Costco is successful, they've been very consistent with that since the Price Club days, all the way back to the original Price Club in San Diego. Please see streamrg.com and use the promo code BREW, B-R-E-W, to sign up for a 14-day trial and get a more robust understanding of Costco or any other company you're interested in. As always, none of this is financial advice. All of the information contained in this program is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your financial advisor before making investment decisions and do your own due diligence. So thrilled to be joined today by Tren Griffin. Tren is a, uh, a well-known person in FinTwit, a well-known author, uh, wrote um, Charlie Munger, The Complete Investor, and author of the blog 25IQ marries uh, a combination of investing advice and hip hop in a unique way. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say today. How you doing, Trent? I'm good. I'm looking forward to this too. Yeah, well, I appreciate you saying yes. Um, for a long time, you would pop into my feed and discuss wholesale transfer pricing and discounted cash flow um, models. And I think now I'm finally smart enough to have the conversation with you. So uh, I look forward to it. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things that's unique about me, well, there are many things because I'm a very strange person, but one of the things that's unique about me is is uh, I don't have the usual attributes of people on FinTwit. And I, I thought I'd go through them because they're sort of interesting and you, you, you get a Venn diagram and you kind of figure it out. But first of all, I'm not anonymous, right? I'm not like you know, Exco or anything like that, or have some secret avatar and nobody knows who I am. Like I'm me. You can, you can, you know, get a hold of me somehow. You find someone who knows me and you can, you can probably get an introduction and we'll chat. But so I'm, I'm here. And then th- the other thing is, uh, I write about investing and I write about business. And this is the Buffett thing about you know, you're a better investor because you're a better business person and you're a better business person because you're a better investor. I sort of do both. And the thing that I love the most um, is uh, is doing everything. Uh, and I'm like insanely curious about everything. And so it's fun. And But the thing that really, you know, excites me is uh, is sharing it with other people and networking. And so... 
I like to say, well, I'm not selling anything because I'm not, you know, I don't have, I'm not trying to raise AOM. I don't have a product I'm trying to sell. And actually I can't talk about what I do for a living because I talk about the history of Microsoft, but I can't talk about what's going on right now because it's, it's public information, right? I can only, I, actually I can talk about Microsoft, but only what's public, but that's tricky. So I don't talk about it at all. Mostly yeah. I can talk about the history, you know, 50 years until microprocessor today. So, so there's that. And then, um, the other thing is, is I've been around, you know, I've been old enough that I've been around. So I, um, I've watched a lot of history and I, I like to say sometimes I'm like Forrest Gump in that, you know, I've just seen, I've seen like amazing shit happen in my life because I was born in this, to be born in 1955 was nuts. Yeah. It was like, what a lucky thing to be born in, you know, because the microchip came out 1971. Um, it was like, uh. I, I, I was a sophomore in in high school, you know, uh, going to be a junior, and you know, I, I got this calculator, and it could do it could program it. It's like, whoa! <laughs> I had no idea. I wish I would have known what that meant fully, but I did know it was amazing, and I did know that a year later it was it was a hundred dollars less, and I thought I'd been I thought I'd been tricked. Yeah, it's like holy, that's a lot of lawns mowed, you know, for for a hundred bucks <laughs> off. But anyway, but I was born at the right time, right? And I've seen stuff. And then the other thing that I'm sort of fascinated in and by is, um, you know, the, the, the early luck and the feedback that comes from, from being lucky early and having the right mentors. And I got, I was like born on third base and I was halfway to home, you know, it's like just luck. Yeah. And then I say, okay, well, how do we scale that? How do we get other people? So they're lucky too. How do we create, you know, like mentoring situations? And the thing I love about, what you're doing, because um, I'm watching what you're you're doing and people your friends are doing, is you're learning in public. Yeah, and and that's like super brave. Like it's super brave, but it's also super necessary because that's the way the world works today. But it's also super efficient in that you learn quickly and you get feedback from people. And this whole idea of feedback is is amazing in that you know it, it starts in biology, but but you know it goes everywhere in our lives, which is this, 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 these loops, these viral loops that in business and and the loops in our lives that make us smarter are better. And how you get taught uh, involves viral loop, uh, involves loops. You know you you do something wrong, you get feedback. The reason why you know on watching a YouTube video is fine, but you're not getting any feedback, yeah. right? Yeah. Having a tutor is amazing, right? Having a community online on Twitter is totally amazing because they can say. Well, you're full of shit, <laughs> or, or or that's great, or what a great idea, you know. Yeah. And you get this feedback, and you learn, and and learning in public is great because you, you got to stay on your toes. Like in FitTwit, if you say something lame, like you're gonna get roasted, right? Yeah. So so you're on your toes. It's great. Yeah. But anyway, but watching you and your friends, uh, I don't know how I got into your group, but watching y you all um, is fun because I'm watching me when I was younger, you know. And 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 I got plenty of mistakes to make uh, still, and I've made plenty of mistakes. But it's fun to watch other people, you know, learn yeah. and get feedback and and grow and you know go into uh, new channels. Anyway, that's kind of sort of a, a long intro, but that's 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 sort of where I'm at. Which is this is like super fun. Got this information graph. Liberty had this great podcast. I forget who it was with. Uh, it was probably with Jim, Jim. Yeah, I assume so. Yeah. And it was marvelous because, you know, he's talking about how he learns and the information graph and what Twitter does and all that. And I, I like listening to – when I exercise or walk, uh, I like to listen to that kind of thing because, again, I'm listening to someone describe their learning process. Yeah. And learning is fun and, and cool. And watching other people learn and success uh, as they find success and grow, it's, like, amazing. Yeah. It's been super fun. Um, you know, it's funny, like I look back at what I thought before I started this journey and I was convinced that I knew the right thing. And I now my interpretation of what is like what I thought was so wrong and I was so convinced I was right. It's embarrassing. But, you know, I think that's part of learning, right? If, if, uh, if you're not looking back at what you said or thought five years ago and have a little bit of cringe, I think you're probably not doing uh, your part to evolve. 
Yeah, if if you're, I like to say, if you're not getting more humble as you grow older, you're not paying attention. Yeah. You know, the more you know, the more you know that that you don't know very much, and you got a lot more to learn, and and there's a lot more left to learn. And the good news is that's the fun part. Yeah. For some people, like, well, you know, what do you mean? It's like there should be an end to it someplace. It's like, well, no. And that's you know because to me, business is the greatest game on earth. I mean. There's no better video game than than just what you know. You do you you pull this lever and you push this lever and you do this and you watch how it changes and it's all it's nonlinear and it's crazy and and like it's great. And then investing to me is on top of that, which is you can actually do it at a bigger scale with more things going on. You're not involved in it. Like I I love most the hands-on process of a business. Yeah. But but second best to me, is investing in somebody else's business and watching them succeed. Maybe giving them a little advice, but, you know, investing in, like, it's fun to go to Costco. It's fun to think about how they run their business. And then it's even more fun to think about, okay, well, how is it going to evolve? And, you know, is how is Amazon going to affect it? And that, to me, is a blast. Now, some people would rather, you know, play with their Corvette motor in the garage, and I think that's great. But for me, given my curiosity... Just getting excited about Costco and, you know, talking to uh, – last time I saw him was in a restaurant. Just asking him questions about how it got started and what he did and, like – and then also just, like, learning from someone like that. Like, this is an amazing guy. Totally amazing. Well, but, you know, it, it, to go, I can't go to Costco and not think – be thinking, like, huh, why do they do that? Yeah. You know, why are the TVs right there when you go in? You know, and, of course, the dollar fifty hot dog. But the whole thing is you're thinking, hmm, this is interesting. Do you mind, um, for people that don't know, you you founded a company in, uh, the, the part that I know for sure is that you sold half in 1999 because you felt things got toppy and went on this kind of uh, mission to educate yourself as to how to go forward. But I'm unclear as to what your startup did. I know it took a ton of heavy heavy lifting. Uh, what did you say, 500,000 miles for five years or something like that? Yes. But uh, I don't know, like, how did the idea come to fruition, and, and what was that process like? Well, the, the amazing thing about the, the era, the period, and people talk about it being similar today, but I don't quite see it, but it's close, is that in, in 91, 92, there was this information highway thing. It was cable companies were going to control these information networks, and you're going to have 500 channels, and, you know, they were going to be controlled on reps and on reps. And I was looking at that from the standpoint of the companies that were trying trying to build it and you know i went to uh omaha and i went to orlando and i talked to people and i wrote a long paper for bill gates and and uh and i said this this doesn't scale this doesn't hunt it costs too much you know just the, the equipment in the home and all it just doesn't scale and so i knew that didn't work and then in 93 i started to think well, there's this internet thing, and people are using it for academic purposes and all that, but they just made it legal to do commerce on the internet. And I said, this is interesting. And it was th that year that Craig McCaw, my friend and former partner, um, met with Steve uh, Jay from, from Apple, and um, uh, Steve described the internet to, to Craig, and Craig said, well, that sounds great. He goes, let's buy it. <laughs> It's not Web three and, yet. And, <laughs> yeah, and and, and Steve Jobs said said no, you know, you really can't buy it. But but we started to think about it, sort of like this Charlie Munger thing, which is you think derivative. You think okay, the internet's going to be great. You can't own TCP/IP or anything like that. But they're going to need infrastructure to do it, right? You're going to need to connect everybody, and there's going to be value in connecting everybody. And so there are a lot of things that were done. Um, I hope these reminders come in and make that noise. I hope you can't hear that. No, you I can't. Probably can. Okay, good. Um, but anyway, the um, uh, the idea of connecting everybody was like that was going to be a great business, and so a lot of things started like like uh, XO, which was a CLAC, and and you know there was UUNet, and uh, uh, we just said, well, why not have a network that connects everybody anywhere in the world? And the only way to do that is with satellites. And so we said, okay, well, you know, it's got to be you know, low latency because fiber is going to set the standard and it's got to be new and it's got to be broadband because, uh, you know, these Iridium and Global Star, which were being proposed at the time, were near red. And so we said, okay, well, it's got to be broadband. And so in, 
Thanksgiving 1993, we went to the to a, to a board and said, uh, "Hey, we're going to create this new system. It's going to be called Teledesic, and and it is the predecessor to what Starlink is is today, and what what OneWeb is, and all that." And we said, "We're going to go build this thing, and we're going to have 840 satellites, which at the time was like nuts. It's like whoa, 840 satellites." <laughs> And, but we, you know, we said, well, you know, you make them smaller and you do them differently and you make them on a production line and yeah, we can do that. And so we said, well, let's make it, uh, but we need $9 billion to do it. So anyway, so I set off to raise <laughs> $9 billion. Was a lot of money. Yeah, it was a lot of money and, and Bill Gates owned half and Craig McCall owned half and Windows um, was uh, a year away from Windows 95 and I... I said no to Bill, and no, I'm not going to go to work for Microsoft. I know you want me to work at Microsoft, but I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to work for you in Teledesic. How do you know Bill? Said, how does how does like how are you writing memos for Mr. Gates and telling him that you're not going to come work for him? Well, so Bill and I are the same age. Actually, I'm a little bit older, so I'm his senior, and he has to give me a lot of respect for that. I like but, that. That's got to feel good. Uh, yeah. Do you make and him his... call you Mr. Griffin? No. <laughs> <laughs> But his dad and my dad were friends in college. Okay. And then his mom and my mom were buddies in in uh in college too. And then they spent a lot of time raising money together. Oh, cool. And 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 my parents were my primary role models, but second were were his parents. Oh, wow. And then we probably met I think I have a pretty good well, I have an abnormal memory. I think we met at the 1962 World's Fair. Oh, wow. So that was a while ago. Yeah. And um, his father's firm took over my wife's firm in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. There we so go. she briefly worked for you know I mean not his dad at this point but the name. But anyway, right. interesting. And so so and so and so Bill and I sort of sort of knew each other. And we hung out in the same places and belonged to the same clubs and you know moms knew each other and they worked together. As, his mom was president of the junior league. My mom was vice president. But anyway, the families knew each other. And Bill Senior is is sort of like my primary role model, right? And um, uh, he um, uh, has been the, the the primary influence in my life. But anyway, in 1980, Microsoft, uh, uh, IBM came to town, and uh, and in a couple of offices away from mine, the contract for MS DOS was was uh, was drafted. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, and Bill said to me, Bill Senior said to me, he said, you know, people say this company, Bill's company, Trey's company, they call him Trey. Um, is going to be big someday. And I said, yeah, it sounds pretty good. You know, software, you know, I did a little, little, you know, research and said, that sounds pretty good. But, you know, when, when I, when we went, I went to school, they were still using punch cards and things like that. So anyway, so I knew him and then his mom was a huge influence on me and his mo mother was big in, uh, us West. Uh, she moved from nonprofits to profits. She was a role model for women today. Uh, uh, amazing. Uh, quality on many boards, including the board of the phone company. She said, well, the cellular thing's going to be big. And I knew the McCaw family, sort of. And I so I got involved with Craig. And then Bill and Craig are friends from high school, though Craig's four years older, I think. And um, the families knew each other, too. And um, so anyway, it, it was an incestuous thing. Seattle was a little town at that point. That's cool. Yeah. And so anyway, so I knew Bill, and we were talking. And, and uh, so anyway, I got involved in the startup. We decided to build this system, and we spent six years building it. We launched one satellite, test satellite, and all that. But we went through this whole period of it was intense, and then 98 hit, and Craig had sold McCaw Cellular to AT&T in, in, in 1995, and he had to, some billions you know, to invest. And so I went to work for him uh, you know, running uh, part of uh, – the business was Teledesic, but also the other part, half of the time, I spent helping him doing venture. And so he sent me down to Silicon Valley, and I did a lot of co-investing co uh, activity with him with various firms and primarily with Benchmark, uh, the, the partners at Benchmark. So I got to know them. But the fun thing is, or the weird thing, or, or the thing that makes me unique is they all these important people want to talk to them, and oftentimes I'm in the meeting. So... 94, I'm meeting John Malone and, you know, Rupert Murdoch's on the phone and, you know, all the, and, you know, you're, so, you're young and you're just, your eyes are like this, like Rupert Murdoch's on the phone. Yeah, that's you know? amazing. What he, an he, experience. He, yeah. And they were doing this thing called the Death Star, which is a whole, we could do a whole issue on what the Death Star was. <laughs> but the important thing is you get to watch these people negotiate and learn 
and uh, there's nothing like like a real life situation to, to get you in ch- it charged up and say, holy, you know, it's like you can see the fear in John Malone's eyes because Mur- Murdoch is the only person in the world who scares him, you know, and 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 so and and Craig would give me commentary and he was in the cable business and his dad was like owned the first rock and roll station and there's all this stuff that you you again i felt like forrest gump in uh in in beijing at the ping pong match you yeah. know you're you're there and you're going wow this is going on i'm here like this is cool yeah that's amazing and so and so and so you learn by watching you know you can learn a lot just by watching um i forgot what movie that, that's from but uh, being there i think uh, but the, the important thing is uh if you're paying attention you can really learn a lot and the thing that's amazing about twitter is you can watch a lot of people uh, who you never would have had access before, and then they'll DM you. Yeah. It's like, this is great. Yeah. It's like, this is a DM. And this is part of what I call give to get, which is um, if you give, and what you're doing on this podcast right now is you're giving some of your time and resources and all that. And by giving, you get, because you get feedback, you get new friends, you get a broader network, you increase your brand. And when I'm mentoring young people, and I, I try to do this m- more and more, is I feel like I get more out of the mentoring than they get from me. Because I learned about young people and what they're thinking about and what their issues are and how they're different. But then also, um, I just get the satisfaction of saying, okay, well, I'm paying it forward. I'm doing something good for somebody else. Because because the, the people who did for me, like Bill Gates and his wife and, and my mom, who's passed, um, they're gone, and I, I can no longer thank them, but at least I can help somebody else as payment for what I did before, which is the concept of paying it forward. But anyway, you give to get, and there's this huge – there's this huge – one of the things I, I counsel people on is there's this huge opportunity. Like let's say you admire X, you know, and you know X a little bit enough so you can say, hey, you know, I know you're working on you know this thing. I'd like to help you. And you, you do the dirtiest, nastiest stuff that nobody else would want to do. And pretty soon the person says, wow, they, they're really caring. And you got reciprocity kicks in. You get a Lollapalooza. They start to think, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, it's like you're okay. And then <laughs> they start to mentor you, you know. Yeah. It's like people don't come to you on the street and say, oh, well, I'm looking for someone to mentor. You know, you look like a good person, you know. Yeah. It's usually somebody who's diligent, who works hard, who gives to get, who gives first. And then they're saying, oh, wow, they did this nice thing for me, and they're smart, and they're hardworking, and I think they're going to go someplace. And so what I'm always telling my young people who I, I mentor is is find somebody and do something for them, yeah. and you will get benefits. And you won't – sometimes you'll find a jerk, and you won't get anything from it. But you, the, the ones that you find who are willing to give back to you, you, you could never – you could never – get that you can buy that yeah it cannot be purchased yeah and all and it so takes is whole... one right like one really good mentor is really all you need yeah I my mean... friend josh wolf, josh wolf talks about uh, a special person who helped lux get started and uh you know it, it's only uh serendipity is plays a part of it but it's only that that aspect of well there's hustle and there's intelligence and there's drive and all that but you sort of you have to you have to do things i mean there's there there are ways to do it one of the things that i want to talk about today was um this whole concept of nonlinearity and what charlie Munger calls lullapalooza and he spends a lot of his time looking for them but basically what we have in life is um a fundamental uh attribute of human beings which is we don't make decisions independently um we heard, um, and we do it because it, you know it's you can't you can't go through life and make every decision independently all day long without not any input. You got to rely on things, and then also, from an evolutionary standpoint, if there was a rustling in the bush and everybody was running, you better run too because it could it could be a lion and your yeah. genes are going to get eliminated from the pool. So you know it's our natural tendency to herd. Anyway, um, and because people herd, you can get positive feedback and positive feedback creates this attribute which is uh, nonlinearity which is if everybody suddenly likes uh, uh, Billy Eilish or whoever the, the star is 
other people like it because there's other people like it and they want to know what everybody, you know, it's like when you're a kid, you're going to grade school and everybody's talking about X. You say, well, I, I don't never, I, I want to, I want to be a part of this conversation. I got to go learn about X, right? But anyway, we heard, and there are talented people who hustle like you, like, you know, the people on Fintuit who are able to basically induce herding. And it's really hard and it's really twicky, tricky. And you do it at multiple scales. But in business, you're trying to basically herd people, get people to herd and think, well, you, my store is really great. Yeah. Or you're an investment manager trying to think, other people trying to think, oh, wow, like, Bill, like, I should give my money to him because other people give him, and he's great. And the more success you get, the more success you get. And a guy named Merton discovered this thing called the Matthew effect, um, applied to academic citations at first, but it applies to everything, which is which is uh, the rich get get richer part of the Matthew effect applies in many, many areas. And so um, as a business person, you're trying to create hurting. You're trying to induce hurting at, at various scales, and it's hard. And you don't think of it that way, but really that's what marketing is. You want mer- you know, nothing like word of mouth. How do you get good word of mouth? You have super high quality. But there are other things you can do to create viral loops. Okay, as an investor, you're trying to find those people who can create viral loops, yeah. who, who can, can create hurting. And the thing about that's so amazing about that is it's nonlinear. It, you know, it, 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 and because it's nonlinear, you can have this phenomenon where, where you know, Bill talks about it, uh, Bill Gates talks about it, um, you know, Jeff uh, Bezos talks about it. Uh, it's in Tom Malberg, my friend's new book, um, it, you know, he had no idea Amazon was going to be as big as it was. He, he thought it was going to be big. That's why he named it Amazon. But he didn't think it was going to be this big. Yeah. You know, there's a famous time when Bill and Kapoor were on stage. And, you know, Mitch turned to Bill and said, well, I think my company's fully valued. And, you know, this is the time when 123 was still, you know, the the so before Excel really uh, – took off and and crushed it like a bug no okay um <laughs> when they were when 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 excel one two three was still big right um uh mitch said i think my company's fully valued and bill said yeah i think ours is too and you just because you just don't you just don't understand the power of the nonlinear. yeah and and if you understand it then you can look for situations that other people don't see it yet right and it's even hard to see today. Like people, are, people say, "Oh, well, the chip shortage is caused by COVID." Well, the chip shortage, shortage was going to exist anyway. People screwed up their chip forecasts, and then a perfect storm hit, and COVID hit, and we, we had a geopolitical situation, which caused people to be very concerned about where things are made, and restrictions are put on China, and they started a hoard, and you get this Lollapalooza, and pretty soon we got a a, a chip supply problem. I don't call it a crisis. A chip supply problem. This is going to last a lot longer than most people think. Okay. So then you can say, all right, well, there's a thesis there. You know, it's going to last. The market does not appreciate how long it's going to last. Who are the companies that are going to benefit and are undervalued because this is going to happen? Yeah. And so it is the investor's job to spot these nonlinear phenomenon. Because if you want to get, like, your crew... It's always talking about, you know, X baggers or X Y baggers, you know, how big it is. But if you can spot something that is nonlinear, you're more likely to get these big returns as opposed to, you know, oh, we did six percent this year and we're gonna do seven next year and maybe five the year after that. You know, the the, the big hits are when you spot something nonlinear. And the thing is that's so amazing to live in this time is because everything is online now, because everything's digital. The, the number of things that are subject to nonlinear phenomenons that are that are black swan is accelerated. There are more things that are that way. When, when, when things were, were, you know, when people were using correcting tape on a typewriter, things didn't quite, you know, move as quickly. Yeah. Today, though, um, things move nonlinear. Now, the bad news is, is that good news uh, is, is, you know, good things happen that are nonlinear. Most things are positive. But some things happen that are negative nonlinear, and and you can get rioting or whatever that 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 is a terrible situation. And so, 
we have to accept the good with the bad. And the other thing is, we can't put the genie back in the box. We can't say, oh, well, you know, we're going to go back to, you know, a day when there isn't the internet and Walter Cronkite tells us what to think. And, you know, there's only four or five news choices. And, you know, you, you, you can't go back to that. Yeah. But we need what we need to accept the good comes with a flip side. We need to we need to learn how to manage that downside. So I'm all over the place. No, I like where you're going. I think um, the thing that I have found interesting about the downside is it's so easy to focus on. And sometimes I get my brain to focus on the downside. And then I'll say, well, hang on a second. Look at how much like Twitter has given me. Like, look at how much it's opened my mind. I mean, I came from this point of view where you know, value is defined by by cheap optically on today's numbers. And I know I'm right if I'm fishing in this pond. And thank God Twitter said to me, that is a stupid way to think. And I started to actually listen. Uh, the ability to not identify with a concept and the ability to find people like you and Liberty and, you know, like Jim has helped me think through things. And like, if you just open... To the idea that maybe you're not the smartest human in the world, the am- the amount of learning that can come from uh, these social networks is incredible. So, to your point, it's it's uh, somewhat what we focus on, right, and how we use them. But then it's also the uniqueness of you. And one of the things that people get hung up on is that um, you know Charlie and, and and Warren have done a great job teaching, but a lot of people don't sort of go to the to the next step and say, yeah, but, um, I'm not them yeah. and I'm never, <laughs> I'm not, I'm never going to be them. I, I don't have the same math mind. I can't do DCFs in my head. Yeah. It, you know, the amazing thing was the, this Schroeder who wrote this book, Snowball, and she was like, went through Warren's office. She got access amazingly. And she didn't find any like calculations or notes or sheets or anything like that. And she, she's, I don't think she really actually got it. But you know, the point is, is like, he's got a mind that, other people don't have and he can do things in his head that we can only dream about right yeah but we can do them with a spreadsheet right and and the spreadsheet doesn't have to be complicated but then the other thing is they have weaknesses that that we don't have which is we were born later we're, we're digitally native um we dump, jumped in and so we have a circle of competence that's different so where we can find value is 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 someplace completely different so you take someone like um Josh Wolf is one of my favorites. You know, he's always talking about there's informational, va- uh, 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 you know, advantage. There's 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 uh, analytical advantage. There's all these different sources of advantage, and we're different. And so, you know, they're 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 sort of nervous about uh, you know a SaaS stock, but that's fine. A SaaS stock can still be a great value because you're still trying to identify a gap between market perception uh, and and actual reality. And if you can find that gap. Then, you know, it's like the, the example I was talking about, which is people don't understand the chip crisis is worse than it is. Okay, who benefits? Yeah. And then you find that company who who is going to be great, do great anyway. It's a fabulous company and sort of you have margin of safety, but also they got this tailwind. I mean, this this whole concept of tailwind is is uh, an amazing thing because it's just life is so much easier if you got a tailwind. Like. To get involved in 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 tech, to be born in Seattle is a tailwind in 1955. You know, to to get involved with uh, software in, in in you know the 70s was a tailwind. To get involved in mobile um, in 1984 when the Seattle network was turned on, uh, December uh, 84, um, that was amazing, right? And then you get this amazing tailwind. But then by uh, I'm gonna say 99, 98, I realized that. Mobile had kind of shot its its amazing ability to create value. It become a commodity business. You grind it out. People like AT and T owned assets, and there wasn't there wasn't this nonlinear tailwind. And then it was time to get out and find an area that did. And for me, that was software. And and you know the good news is, uh, uh, it's fun. You know. It, being happy is just underrated. You know, it's just like totally underrated. And so finding work that you enjoy and that you love and that where the company is growing and people are growing. Because if you're in some big company, you know, and it's shrinking and having headcount cuts and none of the old guys are retiring and there's no opportunity, there are no battlefield promotions, it's like 
elbows are sharp. Like it sucks. Yeah. Like find a find a situation that where there's growth, where you know one day you're managing you know paper supplies and the next minute you're regional VP of you know sales or you know the the the, the things that are happening in a company that's growing. And then the other thing about feedback, going back to my point about hurting, which is, which is because I watch early Microsoft, I watch early Macaw, I watch other companies, early Amazon, is that smart people want to work with smart people. Interesting people want to work with interesting people. Hardworking people want to work with hardworking people. If you get a if you get a core of that going, first seven employees are amazing. But get a core of that going, amazing things happen because well, I want to work at X because there's all these cool people that work at X. Yeah. And they work hard, and they're interesting, and they're fun. And you know, when they're outside of work, they're fun too. They're doing all these crazy things, and it's sort of super exciting. And so, this is a, another sort of example of success creates success. Uh, and so it feed, feeds back on itself. And uh, pretty soon, you have an organization where you have like amazing talent, and you're growing. And because you're growing, there's more opportunities. And pretty soon, you know, you you sort of gone up the the, the ladder. Uh, because you've been pushed by this amazing tailwind. So find the tailwind, you know, and, and you know, oftentimes you, you think, well, I, I'm not sure whether I'd really like software or I'm not sure I really would, would really like, you know, whatever the, the thing is. And oftentimes you get into it and you think, well, this is interesting. Yeah. You know, and you got, I, like, give me a pot and a wooden spoon. I can be happy, right? Okay, so I'm pretty unusual. But a lot of people are sort of like, well, this is intimidating, you know, learning about fusion. You know, it's like, this is hard. But the more you learn, the more you know, the more you know, the more interesting it gets and the easier it gets. And then the, I guess the other thing I'd say is, again, I say to my people who I try and mentor, which is one of the things about life today, I used to go to the stacks even after I graduated at, at the university. And I, because that's where I, you know, get my deep, papers and and deep learning and go into sort of niches but once the internet arrived in 1993 it's like oh it's it's all like like right there you can educate yourself on anything if you begin to become an expert in fusion or whatever quantum mechanics you know you can do it um and especially if you're kind of a self-learner and learn how to network and reach out to people and get help and feedback and all that but you know, you can you can be an expert at almost anything, and and that is an amazing way to be interesting, but also to make yourself unique. Because we all we all need a moat. Yeah. As individuals, we all need sustainable competitive advantage. Like, what's your thing? You know, well, I I I, I do podcasts. Uh, I'm an investor. Um, uh, you know, I network well. I call it information. You know, all the things that you're trying to do, uh, are great. Are fabulous. I just had the power go out, but that's probably not affecting you either. Uh -oh. Are you there? Hello? Damn. What happened? Are you, uh, all right. You, are you back? Yeah, yeah, I'm back. Oh, goodness. You were on a good roll. Okay, so you said all the things that you're trying to do. I network, I'm a podcaster, uh, I invest, and then it, and then it froze. So here we are. Yeah, the power went out. There's a there's a storm coming through here right now. So oh, okay, it uh, wasn't me. I, I'm on campus. No, it wasn't you. It was, storm came through. So you can you can edit that and and make it closer. But the important thing is, what I enjoy. One of the things I enjoy is watching people like you, and like Patrick, uh, Oshani, Yosanasi, learning in public, but also growing as people. And it's fun to watch somebody grow like you. Well, thank you. Right? I, like I, uh, I, I am not at his level uh, or, or close, but maybe someday. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful that he's done what he's done, and I hope that I can do something similar for some people. Um, yeah, but but the point though is that you never want to be Patrick because there's only one Patrick. Yeah. But you you want to be li you want to be like him. Uh, this is another thing I say to young people who I mentor: is that life is like a grocery store. You're like a Trader Joe's. And you have all these attributes of who you can be at any given time. And you're walking through the grocery store and you say, wow, I'd like to be Jim. Mo I'd like to be like Jim. Or, you know, I'd like to be, you know, like all these these people. I, well, you know, I like this quantity, uh, quality about this person. I like they, the way they deal with, with their romantic uh, partner. I like the way they talk. I like the way they exercise. I like whatever. And 
you can you it's unlike high school when people tend to all want to be different in the same way you can be whoever you want to be right yeah now and the older you get you more comfortable you get in your own skin and so you can go to trader joe's uh, to the trader joe's of life and say well i don't want to be that way anymore i want to be like this yeah i want to be like that and it's good because that's how you grow and that's how you're interesting and so for me uh i got a lot of people who i super super admire but there's some things about them that i don't like but that's okay <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I got a lot of things about me that you you definitely wouldn't like if you got to know me, but maybe you know maybe I'm okay uh, on some things. And you say, oh, well, trend's interesting this way, you know, and you, this and this. But I wouldn't want to be that way. Like, oh man. But the good news is you can be you. Yeah. But you can also learn quickly. I mean, it, it's sort of and, and also this vicarious thing, which is, you know, you want to watch the other person pee on the electric fence, right? You don't want to do it yourself. And so that would be painful. You got a friend, yeah, it would be painful, but you know, it, it's usually figurative. Like somebody doesn't know what they're doing, wants to make a career change, goes and gets involved in in real estate, and pretty soon they're bankrupt. Yeah, and and it's because they didn't have circle of competence, they didn't build up slowly, they didn't do X, Y, or Z, and it's sort of like they risked everything. And you look at that, and you say, okay, well, I'm going to be more thoughtful about what I'm going to do. It may not be real estate, but you know, maybe you're like, oh, well, I'm going to go open a I'm going to buy a ski resort or, you know, a, a mini warehouse or whatever it is. It's like you watch somebody else do that and you can say, okay, well, maybe, you know, maybe I need to think carefully about it. It's not that you don't do it, but you learn from the experience of somebody who, who got their fingers burned. Yeah. I, Paying attention is, is a great thing. Yeah, no, I love how you're saying that. I, I think uh, two things remind me back to Berkshire when you're speaking, but one I never understand necessarily why people go and ask uh, Charlie and Warren for life advice. I, I sometimes I think like you're going to the, you're not going to the right person for the right thing. Um, which is not to say that they haven't learned, but I just kind of, sometimes I think people like worship all of the words and it's like, you know, maybe, maybe they don't have every single answer in the world. Um, and then the other thing, um, shoot that you said, I don't know. I but uh, you know, it's just I think that's so true that you can pick and choose who you want to get your mentorship from. And uh oh, the the part about like we're not all Buffett, you know, when I started on the investment journey, I you know, he I hear him say I'd have 50% of my net worth and my best idea. And it's like, but I'm not him. You know, and and I uh to the extent that I speak to individual investors, I hope that I can help them understand how smart Charlie and Warren are and how potentially dangerous that kind of a concept applied to uh, sort of a, an immature understanding of how good they are can be, right? Because you can sink yourself on that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's also, you know, the, the key thing about them is um, is revealed in my feelings about snowball which is i feel it has severe problems as a book because um it doesn't really paint an accurate picture about warren and who he is and i think to understand warren really well you should watch becoming warren buffett which is a, a documentary which came out after the book which is warren saying um to the world look um she portrayed me this way, but I'm really this way. Yeah. And here I am. And, 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 you know, here's me with my kids and they're talking about the fact that I was, um, I was there as a parent physically, but I wasn't there. And, you know, and, you know, you, you, you can tell it's painful to him, but you know, he, he, he understands that he's not, he was not the most empathetic father that there was. Yeah. Um, and he was not the most there parent, you know, he was, even he was there, he wasn't really there. And he was saying, look, that's the way I am. And to some extent, that's my care. You know, that's the way I was wired. And there are good things about the way I'm wired, but there are also bad things about the way I'm wired. Yes. And I'm not wired like he is. I can't do math like he is. I have some strange things about me, like I have memory for words and concepts and ability to put things together that are unusual. But, you know, there are other aspects about me that you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily want to be like, you know. And so, and so, but the human side of of what they do is unique and then the other thing is you know they started out in business and they made a lot of mistakes you know with the department stores and you know, with Berkshire itself 
and they learned from those mistakes and that made them better investors. Yeah. Right. And you probably have to go through some of that yourself. You know, you have to go out and let's say you want to do venture. You're going to make some boneheaded investments in the beginning and you're going to learn a ton from those. And, you know, it's a numbers game. You, you're not going to, nobody bats a thousand, particularly in venture, but you're going to learn a ton from those. And, and, but there's nothing like Buffett says, there's nothing like walking on land to teach you about what it's like to be a, you know, a, a land creature and, you know, being in business, you know, having a lemonade stand, you, you realize like, wow, getting customers is hard. Yep. You know, it's like really hard. And also like, gee, cash, like, whoa, you know, it's like, you. Can, it's just like, there isn't like a supply of cash around. Like cash is important. You got small businesses. They think about cash every day. They think about how to get more customers every day. And be, if you only worked in a big company, you think like, well, there's always cash and you know, companies, <laughs> they always, always tend to show up. It's like, yeah, okay, well, the train was already rolling. Your job is to make it roll faster and better. Yeah. But getting that train started is hard. And if you're a little business person, and so having some empathy there. And so, you know, I think it's it's sort of critical, which is, which is the earlier you get involved kids in a business. And, you know, it can be you know, trading baseball cards or, you know, there's some young people today who trade shoes or, but, you know, lemonade stand, whatever it is, just getting the sense of, okay, well, wow, this is, this is, this is hard. And, you know, this is interesting. And, and, and this is how capitalism works. And this is how business works. And I need to, maybe I better, you know, pay attention. And, 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 but there are fundamental things that you don't have empathy for unless you've actually done them. And, you know, it's like swim, swimming or anything, you, you, skiing, you, doing it is, is, you know, is just so much better than reading about it. Yeah. But anyway, but, but they're not, I'm not Warren Buffett. I'm not Charlie Munger. I never will be, but I can learn from them. And then also, I don't agree with everything he says. You know, I don't agree with Munger about China. I don't agree with lots of things, but I can learn about the way they think. I yep. can. And so, so when 25 IQ started out, this is sort of an interesting story. I said, well, I work at a huge company and I can't really talk about our business at all right now. And I'm sort of nervous. And it was the early days of, of social media, I'm sort of nervous how this is going to go. So I'm only going to talk about value investing, even though I work in software and SaaS. And I'd like to be able to talk about SaaS every day. Like, here's how you create a customer. This is what we did in, in, in Office 365. And this is how it evolved. It's like, can't talk about that. Uh, it's public information. You just can't do it. But I can talk about old stuff. But then I can talk about, well, but this is what Bill Ackman did. Or this is what, it, you know, how George Soros invested. And so I started writing about these people. But then also, because of my background, I've written seven books, I know that people learn by stories. And you got to get them to read. you got to get readers to read your stuff. And to read your stuff, you got to tell stories. Because if you just give them facts, they'll they'll just tune right out. Most people. Yeah. Right? And the amazing thing about Morgan Housel's book is he's got, I think it's 19 stories in there. And if you tell stories, you can sell a million books. Yeah. Most business books, most business books, like people say, oh, I'm going to write a business book. It's like, oh, that's great. Maybe, you know, it's like, what are you expecting to sell? Oh, I can sell a lot. Well, a lot, you know, it's like tell, a business book selling 10,000 copies is a lot. Uh, you know, just because there aren't many people who are interested in business. This is boring to most people. And so, and how do you make it more interesting? You tell great stories. Yeah. You know, Becoming Warren Buffett sold a million copies. It was a good story. House's book is excellent, telling a good story. Um, you know, Michael Lewis, if he wrote a book about taking out the garbage, I'd read that. You know, <laughs> he tells a great story. Yeah, he does. Right? Yeah, he does. <laughs> right? And I'm not, and, and so the, the point is, you know, I was trying to tell stories around people. Like, let's learn from Bill Gurley, or let's learn from this person. Let's learn from Andy Retzler. You go down the list of people. And I'm trying to make it into a, more into a story because it's like, well, you don't want to hear what Trend has to say, you know. And so I can inter have my analysis in there. But, you know, telling a story is good. It's sort of like the Munger book, which is he helped me in 99 to, to, to take money off the table at the right time and to think better. And so I said, OK, well, I hope he writes a book. And then he said, well, I, I'm never going to write a book. I, I, you know, the, they have the. Poor Charlie's, which is a compilation of his writing and essays and speeches and all that, but no one's going to write a book. And I said, okay, well, as my tribute to him, I'm going to write a book about the way he thinks. Biography is 
is damn right that Janet Lowe did that. And there's a compilation, you know, which is which is poor Charlie's. My my thought was, okay, well, I'll write an analysis, which is I'll try and synthesize and make understandable a system of thinking and how he thinks about things. And you can learn from it. And some parts you can say, well, I don't. It's Trader Joe's again. I don't like this. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to do that. You know. And uh, my cervical competence is different or whatever. But that's what I decided to do. But anyway, but my my Munger book, which is my most successful book in terms of copies sold, is successful because he's interesting. He's not boring, and and he's sort of, it's there's sort of a story in there. But telling stories is the way you you um, you learn, and and because it's just the way it was. You know, we did but writing's like two thousand years old. We learned with sitting around the fire campfire, talking about you know stories. You know, well, you know when. We killed this mammoth. We did. You little kid, you're watching. He was like, "Oh, kill a mammoth sounds cool." But the, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds but awesome. The but, but the important thing is, we learn by a story so much better. Yeah, and so much more interesting. And so, I'm not a great storyteller, but I try and tell stories in my own way. I think you're and quite good, good at telling with, stories. I tell some jokes and stories, but I. You know, there are some people who are amazing at telling stories. Well, like you know? Morgan, right? I mean, he's yeah. uniquely good at it. But I yeah, think that, you are good at it. Well, I, I try and tell a story or two. But also, stories are better if you have a good stories to tell. I, I know shit that would curl your hair. I can't tell you about it because people <laughs> would kill me if I told you. <laughs> but that's but that's life. Well, maybe and, someday and, I'll, I'll fly out and we can do it off the record. <laughs> yeah, we'll go, we'll, we'll go fishing. We'll have some we'll have some cocktails and then I'll we'll we'll. we'll discuss some that of would the, be fun the, let me know what you like to drink and i'll make sure you have enough of it to spill the beans <laughs> but the but the but the key thing is in life you know first of all being happy is is underrated but also living an interesting life is underrated and when you're faced with life choices like again going back to mentoring when i talk about young people right i say when you're really young there are all these doors that are open to you you can become a jet pilot in the Navy. You know, you, you can land on carriers. You can, you know, you can join the Peace Corps. You can join this company. You can move here. You can do all these sorts of things. You have, your on, uh, optionality is like amazing. But then as you get older, doors start to close. Like you, you get reach a certain age. You can't be a, a you, they're not going to train you to be yeah, that's, a carrier yeah. pilot anymore. Yep. And, and you know, you, you, you can't do this. Now you can rechange your career and say, well, I, I, I know like one guy like, I don't like business. I want to go to medical school or the opposite. You can do things like that, but you know, you have obligations and houses and kids and you've made promises and all that. It just becomes harder. And then also you become set in your ways and it just, it, 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 you have less optionality. So anyway, so as you're making these choices early, do shit. That's interesting. Don't be boring. Like boring is, is sucks. Yeah. And so, and, and my test is, Will doing this lead to a great story? Hmm. Will the people hmm. are the people interesting? Are they doing interesting things? And it's sort of like my litmus test. And so someone says, "Well, I'd like to, to get you involved in helping University of Washington with research, commercializing it." This is in the 1980s. That sounded fun to me. Bill Gates Senior said, "You you should you should work with me on this." I said, "That sounds great. It's fun. I'm going to learn uh, about." Uh, uh, technology more i'm going to help a, uh, an institution that i care about i'm going to i'm going to do good things um and i'm going to i'm going to have a good life experience i'm going to meet interesting people and i'll have stories to tell you know and you know like closing the big donor or you know whatever it is uh you 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 learn so much if you're invigorated if you're just excited about what you're doing and if it's like you're in a meeting and like john malone's in this meeting he's talking to murdoch it's like this is cool yeah it's amazing like, I, you can you, but if you can put yourself in those situations you you should and there are some things times you have to take a risk and say oh i'm going to do a zero to one startup we're going to have nothing we're going to have not even have insurance but we're going to we're going to you know we're going to get it and we're going to raise money do these other things now, you can't do that at every phase in your life. Somebody other day said, well, you're, you know, you're dead to me if you're not working on Web3 right now. Well, you know, you can't go through your whole life doing zero to one startups one after the other. 
Yeah. You know, there are times in your life when you have to do some other things. There are times you got to give yourself a break. There are times you got to have a pause. Um, you know, this is a this is a marathon, but you do want to do interesting stuff. Web three is super interesting. You jump right into it and and go down various rabbit holes. But you know, who's involved with the project? Are they are they interesting? Do they do interesting things? Are, did you? Do they, you know, they have a, do they hang glide? You know, I used to do that for a while. Did you do really? They scuba dive. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, this the guy named Jeff Joby, whose house was about a couple of miles from, was one of the first guys to make kites. And, and so, and so they were available and there was a Budweiser commercial and they filmed it and they had the kite left over with the label on it and it was available for $200. So some friends and I bought it and we jumped and off mountains and we skied behind boats but the important that's thing awesome. is awesome yeah but the, but if, that's an example of that was cool it was interesting it was dangerous as hell we didn't know what we were doing because the kites were poorly built <laughs> by today's standards so why not design. throw yourself in one and jump off <laughs> why not throw yourself in? yeah exactly <laughs> but the point was was you know i sort of say so they had this thing where like you have kids little tiny kids like uh, in the crib even you know and and you clap your hands to some kids go you know, other kids go, wow, what was that? You know, what's going on? And to be curious like that and say, well, you know, Web3 is going on. I want to know what it's about. You know, so I'm spending a lot of time right now figuring out what's happening. Doesn't mean I jump in with, with my wallet. It, it, it doesn't necessarily mean I might. Uh, I, 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 I don't talk about personal investments, but the important thing is if something interesting is going on, it could be the next internet. And the internet was huge. It could be mobile. Mobile was huge. And so just being curious and open and looking to get involved with people who are interesting, who might be in a situation where someday you could tell a great story. Yeah. You know, going around the world for, for five years, flying 500,000 miles a year, um, you know, I met a lot of things and I did a lot of crazy things. But one of the interesting things for me, I was going to talk about this, turn the tables a little bit. So in 2002, I thought about raising a fund. I said, maybe, maybe it'd be fun. And I had some guys and, and, and some women who uh, will be a team and we're going to do it. We looked into it and um, uh, we looked at Steve Ratner, who's a friend of Craig McCaws and, and he had just spent four years raising the money for Quadrangle and he was on the road like constantly. And I just spent five years on the road constantly raising money. We raised a billion and six or something. Um, and, uh, um, I just didn't want to raise money. You know, I didn't want to, you know, Louisiana teachers, you know, and then Alabama firemen's, and then I'd be in Arizona, you know, uh, whatever police fund or whatever, trying to, you know, raise a fund. But today, you know, people are raising money for IPOs. Like the roadshow's a zoom. Yeah. Right. And it's more scalable and the dose out there is amazing. So what's, 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 goes through the back of my mind is if I was that age today, would I go out and raise a fund? If I was somebody like you, I'd be thinking, okay, establish a brand, establish a network. And, but you're not, you don't have to say, I'm going to take four years out of my life and go on the road like in the old days yeah, and hire consultants and do all those sorts of things. It's, it's, it's more, it's easier to raise money now. Uh, it's easier to establish a reputation. Um, there are less gatekeepers. And so, if I were you, and it was you know back in 2002, I might have raised a fund because it was easier. I would I, I wouldn't have had because my family had already paid a price for me being on the road for five years. Being on the road for another couple of years to raise a fund didn't sound good. Yeah, being being in a fund with only one LP who had billions of dollars that was pretty good. Yeah. That's actually great. But today you get the best of both worlds because you can actually own more of the economics raise the money with with a with an online presentation and there's you know there's money sloshing around like never before yeah so it's what a great is time that? to be you no huh it's a great time to be you well uh in in certain ways yes uh i'm not ready for that responsibility yet but uh we'll see how that evolves i got to make sure that the uh the learning is full before i ask people for that kind of uh, trust yeah but again just go to like to what Patrick's doing 
is if you learn in public and people see you learning in public and learn to trust you and your learning skills and your expertise and your humility in the right situations and your confidence in the right situations, they can see and they say, wow, well, I know him. Like there are people who, who say, who say, I'm like, I was in Hawaii once and, and, and somebody said, he said, you sound just like this guy I read, you know, 25 IQ. And I said, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> yeah. That's me. And he looked at me and said, I feel like I know you. And I said, well, okay, well, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> I'm but, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point is with, with online Twitter and if you contribute, if you give, yeah. if you give, if you say this is the ascetic me, like one of the things I do on Twitter I talk about my fishing a little bit, but one of the reasons I talk about it and, my, and uh, um, how I enjoy my boat is I want to say, look, I'm not, I don't talk about business all the time. You know, I, I'm a human being. Um, you know, like I raise money for Northwest Harvest every year. Um, you know, uh, I, I, there are things that I want you to know about me to say, well, he's not always thinking about customer acquisition cost, right? Or he's not always thinking about this. He's actually a human and a person and, and somebody who, uh, you know, who if, if like if you cut me I'll bleed right yeah I'm 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 like a normal person you know and and uh, and so by being human and in in a situation like this right now where we're on a podcast they're seeing you as a human yeah and the questions you ask uh, the responses you give um, all creates a, a level of of trust well i'm gonna ask you a human everything. question here okay because i've heard you say this now a number of times you said that you're you said you, my kids will forgive me eventually uh is how you said it one way and then you just said that my family paid a price um what was that like when you were going through it when you were doing your startup i mean like did you did you have to get to a point where you forgave yourself for doing that does that make sense so Early in my career, I was a grasshopper, and I spent all my money like going to Thailand and China and Burma and crazy places, you know, and and living in 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 those places, and that was sort of you know just focused on me. And then later, I had my kids later in life. Then I had a family, but then I had to think, well, you know, if these people ever were in trouble, like I want to have enough cash that I can take care of them. And I had to buckle down and create some wealth. And I, I didn't create wealth to get wealthy. I created wealth to have choices. And the reason to have money in the bank is if somebody I care about is in trouble and I can't um, help them, they would kill me. Yeah. Right? Right? And, and you know, like people who, who have no housing, um, they have terrible choices. And the reason to have money isn't to have a – Bugatti, you know, it, it's to have money so you can help people that you love and care about. And so I had to buckle down. But in order to buckle down and do a startup, which is an experience I always wanted to have, because I'd seen Bill have it, and Craig have it, and whatever, is um, you got to give your all to it. And so you got life, family, health, right? And um, uh, business in those years sort of consumed me five and five hundred thousand miles a year is physically hard on the body yeah i was on the united to, to tokyo or the ba to to london like almost every sunday um coming home on friday sometimes gone for two weeks but they paid a price for that and it bothers me still um they benefited from that um in some ways and they saw the benefit of hard work and the benefit of having fun and creating something meaningful and growing as a person. But I wasn't always there. And um, one thing I did that was bad was I, I cut the health out of my equation. When I started the startup, I could run a 320 marathon. When I ended, I couldn't, hmm. you know, and, and, and there are just too many cheese plates coming around the business class and, you know, too much – time in the air there's radiation there's you know move there's exercise so i paid a physical price yeah and so would i do it over again yeah would i mixed it a little bit different yeah um do you think do you I could have what I, I don't know like i think but, that might you know, be I, easy to say in hindsight but hard to execute 
it, it is hard to execute because you're all in and you know it's just to raise nine billion dollars we started with you know four people and now the good news is the good news is our shareholders were bill gates on half and craig mccaw on half and at the time like they were the names and so i could get any meeting i wanted with anybody in the world i remember i was in tokyo once and i met with mitsubishi it was like it was me i was given a presentation and there was like 29 people around this <laughs> huge conference table <laughs> and they weren't there because i was there they were there because bill gates and craig ma had had reputations had promotes that said i better pay attention because i don't want to miss it this time yeah right yeah you know like i missed the last one and so i could get any, any meeting i wanted we met, raised a billion six and and you know i got to travel the world but to some extent, I'll always regret not uh, giving more to my family, and I gave in different ways. You, you, you got to make choices. Everything's everything's a trade off. And I, the thing I learned about working with engineers is there's so many trade offs. Yeah. You know, there's there's so many trade offs. You go to let's say let's say you decided to raise a fund and you go out and you spend, you know, three or four years on the road, um, not not so necessary anymore, but you did. You're gonna, they're gonna be better off financially. They're maybe gonna have less debt when they get out of college, um, uh, but uh, or none. But the important thing is, it's a trade-off, and you got to realize it. You know, you you can't be there for every little league game during the week and be raising a fund. Yeah. And, and so you know that there's a choice, right? And it's hard. Yeah. You know, it's hard. I, um, and, my, my dad grew up, um, quite wealthy. And I think, uh, what I noticed from his experience is, uh, I, I think he would have benefited a lot from his parents being around a lot more. Um, but you know, they kind of had a socialite life and I think, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a stretch to say they neglected the kids, uh, which is a shame, right? Um, because why have it all if you're not going to spend your time with your kids? But that was sort of like the next iteration of uh, comfort, right? So I was always, I was always old when I was young. So even when I was like little, like six years old, and I was put with my grandfather on his boat, um, I was paying attention to what they were saying, and um, they didn't think I was. They thought I was just a six-year-old kid, but I was listening to what they were saying. And they were talking about Seattle was a wild town in those days. And um, it was an open city and there was gambling and prostitution and numbers. And, you know, there was there was a lot of stuff going on until 1967 that wasn't above board. And there were also mistresses and things like that. And they also drank a ton, hmm. like, you know, in the afternoons. And they got habituated to it so they could drink a lot. Like if I drank what they drank, I'd be asleep. <laughs> yeah in the afternoons but it was wild but but it, it opened my eyes really early on to everybody has a, a secret every family has secrets yeah and what what may appear to be normal they were telling each other things that that other people didn't know about you know like oh I get, my mistress you know I got her living here and you know it's like I don't say that a mistress <laughs> and then I go skiing we go skiing and you'd be like up in the, the skiing place and and uh, and the, there'd be the pool, and uh, people would be swimming in the pool, and I'd see Mr. X, and he'd be swimming with this young girl, and then they start kissing. I'm going, Mr. X is kissing this girl in the pool. <laughs> Mrs. X would not like that. And my parents would go, Oh, why don't you go play some sorry or something? You know, it's like go. With it. But I would pay attention. Yeah. Right? And I realized that that uh, that people aren't perfect, that families have secrets, that I want to do better than that. That I want to be stronger than that, and 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 I want to have things in my life that aren't that way. I mean, this is sort of the anti role models. Yeah. Early on, I realized I don't want to be like that. Yep. I don't want to be the guy who everybody w wants to pay golf with, that doesn't pay attention to their kids. Yeah. It, you know, the guy who's who, who does everything for the community but nothing for their family. For the guy who's very liberal in his values about the community but treats his 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 own family as a tyrant. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things about my analogy about Trader Joe's is as you go through Trader Joe's, there are all these things you don't want to be like, I don't want I don't want to grab that. Like, you know, being abusive to to my kids or not getting attention to the kids or giving them too much attention or not letting them fail or whatever. 
and you know we all do our best and but hopefully we're getting better over time yeah um and we're all we're all humans and so we got to forgive yourselves and so i forgive myself but you know i i wish i could have had it all but i didn't but i had a great life i have had you know I'm I'm reaching my pull date. I get, it's not on the back of my shirt, but <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. I I think you got a lot longer left, which is good. <laughs> I find myself. Well, I wanna, I wanna, it's interesting you're talking about health and stuff. I I've found myself thinking a lot more about it lately. I was um I was camping outside with my kids last night, and I looked down, and they're like sleeping head to head, and I I just said to myself like I gotta I gotta make sure that I'm old enough to see them have kids. You know, yeah. I, I really, and, and healthy when it happens too, right? Like I, I don't want to be older and not healthy. I want to be the grandpa that well, can pick them up. <laughs> one of the things my dad physician would, would told me, which was keeping in mind, he said, you know, you'll have a, a bunch of friends in their late forties and, and early fifties who will just break. Yeah. You know, some aspect of their our heart will explode or, you know, whatever it'll happen and they'll just die. And you know that's just that's just life, and so you got to prepare yourself, and you don't want to be one of those people. So take care of yourself. And then there's then there'll be a period where people don't die, but then all of a sudden they'll start to wear out. You know, it isn't breaking. It's just like all your systems just start to go, hmm. and you can't do this or you can't do that or you have your hips replaced or cataracts or whatever. But your body's basically falling apart, and the process is nonlinear. Unfortunately, the aging process. Yeah, and so. Paying attention to that is wise, but it's also paying because because you should try to avoid it. But also, it should make you think like, you know, what the Warren Zavon uh, thing, which is you know, enjoy every sandwich, you know, because you never know if you're going to be dead tomorrow. Yep. Right. Like enjoy every single sandwich. Enjoy this conversation with you. Enjoy, you know, what what I'm going to do later on in the day. Just enjoy that, like right now. And it's easy to to fall into a trap of not enjoying the present moment but watching people who don't do it is a reminder and then when you lose a friend when suddenly you know i had a friend who had colon cancer in august and he was dead in september uh-huh. you know stage four and, and it was just so fast and i didn't even get a chance to see him and say goodbye yeah um and so when that happens to you you think and then the other thing is i have a really close friend who was a mentor to me in terms of like being happy he was like the happiest guy i knew and I was always trying to be happy like him. I didn't realize that his happiness was he had a cocaine problem. Huh. And it, and it killed him. Eventually his heart blew up. But the, but the important thing was, for me, it was like, we were really close. We were super close. And I didn't even know he was taking drugs. Yeah. I mean, maybe a little, but, you know. You know not like that. Not like that. Right? And so that, let me think, well, what, what, what if my other friend's... What if I paid attention and would have known that it could have helped him? But what if my other friends have that too? You know, what if my family has that too? What if my, you know, anybody in my community or whatever? And so, one of the things I wanted to talk about today was my friend Tom Alberg's book, which is a lot of things we've talked about today, like feedback loops and all that. They apply to your community too. And his book is uh, uh, called Feedback, and and uh, uh, the 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 important thing about life is um it, it applies at every, these principles apply to every scale and applies to your city if you make a difference like bill gates and mary gates and my parents and people like that if you if you give you get and to have a good community you you have to sort of do things you have to support your university you need a research university you have to support you know people who are who are in trouble and down um you know and so the big scale is you want your city to be be great like support your university you know give to organizations like uh uh united way that support you know sort of the broader community the other thing is on a micro level you know you got uh some man he gets fired or it could be a woman but i'm just saying picking a man he gets fired he starts drinking because he feels bad it was not his fault you know the company had trouble and he got fired he starts drinking and then he strikes his or th- they strike their spouse then the family gets separated by the courts or whatever, and then depression kicks in, and then he goes in a spiral down. Pretty soon he's homeless. The the the, uh, the rest of the family is d- destitute, and they start to fall apart. And that is a feedback loop 
that it's negative. One thing feeds on another and you're going down. Occasionally, you have to step in in a situation like that and say, we're going to create a positive feedback loop for them. So there's an organization called Rither in this city, which takes foster kids who are so abused they can't even put them in foster homes. Oh, wow. The worst of the worst, right? In this in this state, 100,000 kids are taken out away from their parents with foster homes. But there's some kids that are so abused that they... They they can't even be placed, right? They're too. Oh. They're too, so th- so these kids, if you can turn their lives around with with a positive feedback loop, give them some mentorship, give them some positive stimulus, make it so their lives can get normalized. You can create a positive feedback loop for them, and the city benefits because the more people who are recovering like that, the better the city gets, and the more people say, "Wow." It makes me tear up a little bit yeah. because I think about real people. Um, the city can get better if you help that individual, like doing that individual thing. And and I have this one friend who I just love. They've taken in like three different kids, and they they're because in foster situations, and they're like their own kids. And they took them on late in life in their early teens, and they treat them just like their own kids. And I'm like, oh, what a studly. I mean, what a yeah! It's an amazing you're giving somebody. It's an amazing life. thing, but or a shot at a life. If, but but those but those little things inspire other people. That other people say, "Wow, you know, Carl and and uh, his wife, they're doing amazing things." You know, I should do something like that too. And that spreads. You know, like the goodness spreads, and the positive feedback loop spreads, and so you can create a community where people care about about creating good situations for others and then helping people who have gotten into that downward loop. And, you know, y- you can do an amazing thing just by getting somebody a place warm to stay and and a little bit of confidence and, and that first job or whatever. And that's not that difference than, than you got a small business, you're trying to sell falafels, you're trying to get your first customer, trying to get word of mouth, you're trying to get employees, trying to get a good rep, you know, all these things. It's just applying it to a human being who's in trouble as opposed to creating your business. Or, you know, as an investor, as I said, trying to spot people who are going to create those amazing, those amazing stories uh, are often... Uh, embryonic you don't really know for sure but you think this person's worth backing this person's worth worth getting behind this person's worth helping out and so um as an investor as a business person as a community leader as a parent you know with with with, you got a parent who's got a kid who's struggling same thing you want to create a positive feedback loop yeah they're getting bullied at school or you know whatever like how to create confidence in them you know how do you, how do you how do you get them so they're thinking well about themselves how to get get you know, use them with some leadership skills and then also one of the key things is is bravery in order to do anything worthwhile in life creative but also in business and life you got to be brave and and learning in public is an example of bravery writing a book like here's my book you know, and someone's going to write some nasty review about it or whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's bravery. You know, it's like, here's my art. Here's my singing. You know, here's here's what I do. You know, whatever. And these things are acts of bravery. And they're, and they're things that make you um, learn and grow. And But if you don't, if you don't do that, you don't grow. And so anyway, so being brave. But being brave at every scale in your community. So anyway. No, I love it, man. That's uh, that's more important than anything else that we were going to talk about today. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I just try to, uh, I just try to set my kids. I mean, I'm sure that my kids will end up on a couch and blaming me for something, but I'm just trying to minimize those amount of things, you know, uh, and create the positive feedback loops in their life. Um, and then I, I have often thought down the road, uh, there's, there's a lot of. A lot of things I want to do I, I, in an interesting sort of series of events. I moved from Chicago to a smaller town where I'm at now, and it's really inspired me to get more involved. I think there's something about being in a like a, a large city that I felt disconnected from the community, and here I really feel like a tangible sense of community. It's it's inspired me to give back more. It's nice. Yeah. Well- 
it, it's 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 a personal thing. But I want to go back to the kids thing. I don't know how old your your kids are, but I've been uh, through the process. Four, six, and seven. Okay, so so you you if your approach is is like I think it is, and you will you will reach a stage around twelve or thirteen, will you will you transition from they think dad is amazing and perfect to dad's an idiot and doesn't know anything. <laughs> then hopefully the, they the tr- find me at 30 and say you weren't so dumb. It won't be 30. It'll, it'll be before that. But, but the important thing is it doesn't have to be completely bad if they know they can report, approach you. And if you know you, you, you've, you've enough exposed enough to know that, that you're, you're humble and you realize you have weaknesses, but, but this, the snap is, is sort of difficult. What you have to remind yourself of is that's normal. Yeah. Like we are programmed as a species to, to move away from, from the parents and to try new things and to experiment. And that's how evolution happens is you go off and, you know, you move to the America from England or whatever. But, you know, that's sort of normal. Um, but then eventually they're going to come back and they're going to say, well, Dad, he was like, whoa, he was right about that, yeah. you know. And, you know, he wouldn't have been perfect, but he was okay, you know, in these ways. And, you know, uh, they, they're going to love you throughout the whole process. But they're going to think sometimes that you're not, like, completely with it or or, or completely uh, uh, making the right choices. But the important thing is if you, if, you, if you teach them to be independent beings, they will be okay in life. If you if you keel over at a heart attack when they're like 19 and you've taught them to be independent, they're going to be okay. If you've made every decision for them until they get into college or even some kids after, when you die, they're screwed. Yeah. They never made any decisions, right? And so um, the important thing is, is that's a trade-off though because they're not going to call you when they're when they're 32 years old, if you've taught them to be independent and make their own decisions, right? They're not calling you saying, mm-hmm. "Okay, well, I'm going to buy a car. What should I get?" You know, they're going to just buy a car, right? And it's kind of going to hurt a little bit that they don't call you as much as they should. But if you truly love them, if you truly care about them and not yourself, you'll be glad that they're independent and making those decisions. Yeah, you'll be confident that they're making those decisions, and you won't feel like, "Well, if I die, they're screwed." Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so it's a very selfless thing to do. It's like some some adults just love it. Like, oh, my kids call me about everything. It's like, ugh. you know. <laughs> yeah. Because you go, you it, most people go to college with people like that. You get to college, and there's somebody who's never had made a decision decision in their whole life. Their parents have made every decision for them. Then they have to make some decisions on their own, with drugs, with you know, drunken driving with all kinds of things, they make stupid decisions and they either hurt themselves or are dead. Yeah. Because they never made a decision before. They were never allowed to make a decision. Yeah. Right? And and it's sort of like, I'm a big believer in sleepaway camp. And one of the reasons I'm a big believer in sleepaway hmm. camp is you have to need to learn how to make make friends. You join a new company, go to, you need, learning to make friends is a skill. Huh. Right? Yeah. And so, it, it's totally a skill. And so, a lot of kids have never made any friends. They've had the same friends since kindergarten, all the way through school, never been away, all that. And they go to college and they come back after a year and they say, I'm leaving, I'm quitting, I'm done. I can't, didn't make a single friend. Well, their, sta- their standard for friend is somebody who had known since kindergarten. Yeah. You know, like, no. Like, you got to learn how to make friends and you only know them for a week. Like, find somebody. <laughs> yeah, you know, find a right. person. But that's a skill. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and if you don't teach it to them, if you don't, if you don't say, well, you're in a sleeping camp, you don't know anybody. Like the classic thing was taking my daughter to her sleep camp and she cried. And I was like, oh, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I want to go. And I pick her up like, you know, I don't know, like a week, 10 days later, something like that. It's like, I don't want to leave. And I don't want to leave. And so and so, so yeah. great. And, but that, but there are those experiences that you have to go through yourself. Dad, they're torturing and, me and, here. And then it turns out, no, please don't take me out of here. Yeah, exactly. And, and, but a lot of it is you're learning, you're learning new skills. And so we, we, we sort of segue that into business and investing, which is, you know, there's, there's just, there's no jump in the water. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's the best way to learn. And, but also, you know, jump in the water with other people who are going to help you, you know, as you go through the process and then have, you know, find great mentors and, and, you know, read widely 
and be curious and uh, be humble. And, um, you know, there's a strange, you know, Munger has this thing where he says you want to be patient but aggressive when it's time. Like it's a weird attribute, which is really, 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 really patient but really, really aggressive at the right time, like quickly to jump in. But there's also in life, there's this thing of you want to be um, brave and confident but humble, right? Yeah. And you would think, well, brave, brave and confident and humility should be, you know, they're but they're not. They're consistent. You can be brave and humble. Like, you know, brave and non-humble people, most of them are dead. Uh, you know, you, you want to have people who are thoughtful <laughs> yeah. about the ways. When to be the, brave, the, yeah. The, when to be brave, right? And so, you know, you get involved in real estate, you don't know what you're doing. You, you are brave, but you're, you know, you're bankrupt. You're starting over. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things about life, too, is uh, Munger talks about this, which is he reaches a certain stage. You don't want to go back to go. Yeah. Right? You, you want to have a grub stick. You don't want to, you want to go back to zero. And so putting yourself in a situation where you're risking um, what you what you need for something that you only desire yeah. is insane. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like take some money off the table. So early on in my career at a good time, someone took me aside and said uh, – and said – and said, you know, Warren Buffett, you know, he's doing this and this and this. He said, but you know, he's he's got a slug of treasury bills too. Like, like he's he's in a good situation. And and playing life with house money, you know, is so much more fun, you know, than than thinking, well, if I screw up here, my family's not going to eat. Yeah. You know, or or we're going to be, you know, we're going to be living in 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 housing that 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 I wouldn't be happy about. And so. You know, the reason to have money is not to have wealth or not to have things. It's to be able to take care of the people you love and to have choices. And having no choices sucks. Yeah. It's under having choices is is underrated like happiness. Yeah. And they're related. You know, not having good choices makes you unhappy. Yeah. And I mean, it, on top of going back to go, going back to go at an age that is hard to restart forget about the pain of losing whatever the freedom that you had was like that. That is my version of hell. That's why uh, sometimes I, um, sometimes I get obsessed with this idea of like, am I outperforming the S and P? And then I just say like, this is creating flawed decision-making in my head, right? Like the, the, I could always index that's possible. I like active management. It keeps me engaged. It's led to talking to people on this podcast, I can't, I mean, talking to you has been phenomenal, right? I don't want to stop this. So I'm getting other benefits. Um, so like reframing what I'm actually trying to accomplish creates more happiness, if that makes any sense. And, and fundamentally my risk tolerance may not be as high as I used to think it was anymore. Well, it, it, it changes because your opportunity cost is, is different and you're impacting more people. You, your optionality, so doors have changed. Yeah. And so for me, um, when I took money off the table, I took enough money off the table. So um, I had no debt. I was going to be fine retirement. No one was going to have to worry uh, about anything. And, you know, the rest of it was just like house money. Yeah. You know, literally, I'm, I'm playing with the house's money, you know, and, and let's have fun with it. And then when you're doing that, um, you can concentrate in a way that other people – don't think about. So to me, I have a barbell. That's what a barbell is. And I enjoy it. And so I have a level of portfolio concentration. I never talk about the stocks I own, although people kind of figure out that I own a little Berkshire, a lot of Costco, you know, I I own a bunch of Microsoft, obviously. Um, Those stocks have all done pretty good, Um, have done well. And my level of concentration would make most people nervous, almost everyone nervous. But I've also got a slug of of cash and in stuff that's safe on the other end of my barbell. So, but I don't own a lot of like GM in the middle, like, you know? Yeah. Um, well, why mess uh, around uh, with uh, assets that don't inspire you? Like it doesn't make sense anymore at a certain point, but it's, it's also not interesting. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just not interesting. Like, and it can be for like, somebody else, right? Like it doesn't matter, right? It's just not if your you thing. Really love, if you love cars and you love that and you want to buy, you know, some Stellantis or however you pronounce that thing, uh, that, that that's you know cool. More power to you. And if you like finding like cigar butts, um, you know businesses that are down, run by 
nasty people, you know, and you're going to buy a chewing tobacco company or whatever the hell, hell, you know, cigar butt you can find. It's like, that just doesn't interest me. I'd rather interested be, you know, Jim Senegal and Costco early on to me was like, this is a guy I admire. Yeah. This is an interesting company. They're doing good, you know, for lots of people. Um, they've got a moat, you know, uh, you know, try and come after them with, with their gross margins. And, and I, I just love the model. I, is Amazon going to take them over? I don't think so. Yeah. Is Amazon a great stock? Absolutely. Do I own Am? Well, anyway, I don't <laughs> but, but the, the, yeah. hard, the one of the hard things is, is again, um, what I'm trying to, to do is give back and, and pay it forward. And to the extent I choose stocks, then I'm not talking about fishing. I'm talking about fish. And if I just like, oh, trend gives a great stock tips. I'm not teaching anything. Yeah. Like you, uh, I'm not a believer in stock. T- I know, you know, uh, you know. Occasionally on a st- uh, if I hear the shoe shine, shoe shine boy g- giving a stock tip, then I know then eh, maybe you know something about broad, the broader market. But I don't give out stock tips just because I don't want people to think that way. I would rather have people be independent and think for themselves. And um, you know, I I can have made a big mistake and and but also. I've been fortunate in ways that others haven't. And my situation isn't their situation. They could have a, a spouse that, you know, can't work and they have a, I almost had an avalanche of a keyboard there. Um, uh, a, a spouse that has trouble, you know, I, I've got parents I've got to care for, whatever. I shouldn't be assessing their risk unless I'm in their wealth planner and I know everything about their situ- situation. Yeah. yeah. Now, occasionally I'll have someone come to me and say, okay, what stocks I should buy? And then I dig into it a little bit because I care for the person and they're in trouble. And um, they've got like a ton of credit card debt. Like in that situation, I, I kind of guide them towards, towards you know, like this credit card debt is a real problem. Um, uh, most people aren't interested enough in finance to be doing what you and I do. And, you know, most people should should find a way to match the market in, in a low cost situation. But other people, like, it's fun. And then also, some people, even though they should be buying into Excel funds, won't. And so if I can help them be a little bit better, then that makes me feel good. Yeah. Well, and then there's I can a chance that's and have fun. me. But so no. far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the important thing is, you know, it's a fun game. It's like video games. There's dopamine in, in finding the gold and learning new things, just like there is in, you know, being a master sergeant in a in a video game. Yeah. You know, I, I find, um, I, I just like it. I, I like, um, you know, I guess there's some endowment bias or whatever, but I, I like the companies I own. It gives me purpose to get up and read about them and, uh, I enjoy it. So I, I don't see a reason to stop. I'm, I'm not, uh, provably incompetent. And I think the, uh, the question remains whether or not I'm competent. We'll see over time. One of the things that about my personality has always been weird is, is, uh, in in this little town that's near the building I'm in right now, there was like the first McDonald's, and then there was a Herfie's, and then there's a local chain called Dick's. But anyway, they were all head to head, and hamburgers were big. And but anyway, it was even as a y- youngster, I was going to when I went. My parents took me there. I was saying, I wonder how much they make on this hamburger. I wonder how much how much this bun costs. You know, one of those people that are getting paid. You know how you know. You know, one place had sit down, you know, one place had, you know, uh, you know, a different vibe to it. And and it was fascinating to see the differences. And it's just like, I don't know. I just want I want to know how things work. And people will sometimes turn to me and say, give it a rest. Yeah. You know, stop asking these questions. You know, it's like, I don't want to understand the history of this. You know, it's like, yeah, I know this building used to be this and this is used to be this way. But, you know, I don't care. Like, stop. And so, but that's just me. I'm just terminally curious. I want to, I want to know, I want to know about the way things work. I want to know how it happened. Why are things this way? Yeah. And that is fun, but it's also just the way you're wired. It's my and oldest. So, he he would watch uh, stuff on TV, like a train would bring letters past, right? And he wouldn't learn the letters, but then, um, like we would notice he was watching how the wheels would move. Right. And he would, he would always be like focused on how things are happening rather than the lesson that was being taught. It was, it was kind of weird. And then we realized like, he's just this kid that deconstructs how it works all the time. It's just naturally what that you, way. 
One of the things about engineers is interesting because I work with some of the best ones in the world over the years is that um, some people are just savants and, and truly are savants. And so there are some engineers who can type twice, like software programmers, they can type twice, twice as fast as a normal person. And they really like just quite a lot of code, like twice as much code. Bad news is that they never document what they do. And if you ask them to, to fix it, they'll oftentimes start over. Like hmm. So they're amazing minds. They're savants at writing code, but they got some problems. Then there are some other people who are geniuses. They come up with this one iterative step that no one's ever thought about before, like recalc or whatever in Excel. You know, that person has this amazing ability to conceptualize something that is just fundamentally new, right? Hmm. And then the other thing is there are some people who are systems thinkers. And so I met with the head of Boeing Defense and Space once, and he said, you know, he said, well, Jerry King, he goes, well, I got 30,000 engineers. And he goes, I got seven. He goes, I got seven that can design an airplane, right? Hmm. And he said, I can tell you their names. One of them was, felt, you know, it was a person you would recognize his name. But the important thing was they were system thinkers. They could do everything. A lot of engineers can only design, you know, a tail assembly or a wing flap or whatever. But the the, the, the mind that can put it all together, hmm. human resources, engineering, supplies, supply chain, that whole thing, these people are special. As an investor, if you can find someone like that, you bet on them. Hmm. You know, they're, they're like unique, but they're not very common. And so they're one in 5,000 kind of, kind of minds where they can design a system where they can put it all together. And when you find someone like that, you know, back them. But anyway, but some of that getting to this point you were talking about is nature and nurture. And so that wheel focused is telling him something about what makes him happy. And he, you will find, I think if your experience is like the ones I've seen that you will be amazed at how different your kids are in fundamental ways. They'll have some similarities, but they'll be different. Yeah. And then you'll go to the kid's classroom and help out, you know, as you should, as a, as a parent. And you'll look around that classroom and you say, my God, these kids, the diversity in this one classroom is amazing. How does this, does this t- teacher keep a lid on this? Yeah. Thing? You know, you get physical maturity, mental maturity, interests, you know, you got attention span. All these variables are all, and it's it's every child. They realize like, wow, the world's a pretty diverse place. We were designed that way, yeah. right? And so, how do we how do we focus that? You know, how do you create a, a team? You know, I don't know if you do any coaching coaching at all, but you know, taking a bunch of really diverse people, and oftentimes great people like in the military. Uh, I've got a stepbrother who is a who is a three star. Um, is if you can take a lot of C's and turn it into an A organization, like that's leadership, right? Yeah. And these people are not rocket scientists necessarily always. Some of them are. Um, but um, you get a lot of diversity in, in melding that and doing that. Some people are just good at things. You know, I mean, I've been around enough people like Bill Gates, Craig McCobb. You, you see, seen people over the years. And, uh, you know, Bezos... Um, they have an ability to do things that is almost savant-like, and you can't pretend that you're them. You might be, but you can't pretend that you're them. And then even them, they're they're different as night and day. Like Bill Gates, Craig McCaw, like one one's analog, one's digital. You know, Craig is a dyslexic, um, and he but he uses that to advantage. You know, the, their ability to do math in their heads, their ability to process information, how they do things. It's like there's no one way to do things. Hmm. But some people have this sense of this is how I build something, given my unique attributes. And then the other thing I've noticed is these people, they fill in around them what they're weak at. And so if you look at early Microsoft or whatever, Bill hired people who taught him things that he didn't know yet, who complemented his own skills, and and he became whole by, by the process of aggregation, became better, became more fulsome, you know, Craig McCaw was the same way at McCaw, you know, hiring good finance people, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you go down the list of, of, I could give you their actual names, but they all had different attributes. None of them were the same, but together they were an amazing team. Yeah. Um, you know, and so anyway, but you, you, you find that. Uh, and so 
when you see it in your real life as a business person, then you say, okay, well, I want to find a company like that too, which is one of the reasons I like Costco. I like their culture. Culture is hard. Culture is, is hard to turn around once it goes bad. Um, culture is hard when you merge with some company and they have a different culture. How do you, you get the two companies to come together and do things, you know, in, in, the, in the right way? Oftentimes when Macaw bought companies in the early days of cellular, you'd, st we stupidly sold off the U.S. in peace and gave it away in auctions and blah. Anyway, they had to be rolled up. When you bought these territories, oftentimes they were owned by a person. You had to get rid of that person because without that person gone, you couldn't meld them into one culture. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. You, you, you can't do a roll up and have, you know, 90 cultures. Yeah. And, and so you, you find that um, no culture is perfect, but but you need to have a culture, yeah, and it needs to keep improving, and and diversity um, is good, but you know you're only going to have one, you know, if, if you have 50 cultures within that culture, it's going to be bad. You want to have diversity within your culture, yeah, have one overarching culture with diversity of opinion that is and and people yes. that is uh, valued, right, yeah. And but but you have to have a sort of a guiding, you know, the North the, Star the Costco, for lack of a better term. Yeah, Costco has North Stars that everybody rallies around, and you can't they can't go out and buy you know, Kroger or something like that and and expect. Yeah, it wouldn't it work be, out. Wouldn't work. Yeah, cool. Well, I uh, I mean I really appreciate your time. Thank you, thank you for saying yes. Thank you for spreading wisdom. And, uh, you know, you've got a standing invite anytime you're not on Jim's podcast to come on this. If you got anything to say, I'd love to talk to you. Also, well, I, I do want to come out and have those drinks. So watch out for me. Okay. It's a well, long the, flight. The, uh, you know, but you come out here in, in August. Yeah. There you go. You can come here in, August. in the winter. Yeah. But <laughs> in August, like people go, if you leave Seattle on vacation in August, you're out of your damn mind. Yeah. Like it is, it is the month. It is, it is warm and not humid and it's pleasant and all that. Now today, a couple of times I thought the power is going to go out today. Like today it's nasty and stormy. I'm going out in my boat tomorrow, but it's supposed to be a little nicer, but it's going to be cold and the heater's going to be going. So anyway, <laughs> well, I hope right. you well, enjoy. Well, you, you got, you got to, you got to get out and, 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 uh, and be part of the, the environment, uh, year and that means uh it's not always going to be like you, you have the other day <laughs> the other day i saw you in in shorts and and i i i, I miss that so anyway <laughs> well, all right you come and visit i, August, I would like to, to for be. real i uh i got a god god child out there that i need to see it's been too long so uh when we all do right. i'll look you up very good all right take care Trent. thank you so much all right bye-bye bye.